Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless in the last days the prophet zechariah tells us israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against jerusalem zechariah 12 2 and 3 behold i will make jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against judah and jerusalem and it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. To the Mideast and Israel on high alert following the fourth deadly attack there in just three weeks, renewing tensions between Palestinians and Israelis. A third man dying overnight after the latest shooting there. ABC's Ariel Resha has the latest now from Tel Aviv. Ariel, good morning. Good morning to you, Janae. Israeli forces are now conducting raids inside Janine, the town of Janine, and in the Janine West Bank, northern town refugee camp, as, the, as perpetrators have come inside of Israel from that area, exposing a major vulnerability in Israeli security. Palestinian officials say that at least one militant has been killed in clashes with Israeli forces inside the town of Janine, and many more have been injured. Sources are now telling ABC News that Israeli forces have surrounded the home of the perpetrator of the attack here in Tel Aviv that claimed the lives of three Israelis. Here on Dizengoff, which is the heart of Tel Aviv, there is a growing memorial to those victims. As the city awakes from the fog of violence, many Israelis have taken to the streets. They're still sitting in restaurants and cafes. Fourteen Israelis have died in the most recent spate of violence over the past few weeks and there are growing concerns with the convergence of Passover holiday and Ramadan as well as Easter that tensions are on the rise. Roughly 80,000 Muslims were able to gather at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the old city of Jerusalem for the first Friday prayers of Ramadan without major incident. I should mention that Hamas has praised the attacks here inside of Israel that have killed Israelis while the Palestinian Authority has condemned them. So far no claim of direct response responsibility for this attack here in Tel Aviv that left those three Israelis dead. But this region is a tinderbox and there are growing fears that one lone gunman could send this region spiraling into full-scale conflict. Oven bread allowed in hospitals during Passover. Well, that issue could lead to yet another political crisis in Israel. And it could force the Jewish nation to hold new elections less than a year after Prime Minister Bennett's coalition took power. The crisis was triggered by the resignation of a right-wing member who claims Israel is losing its Jewish identity under Bennett's leadership. Chief International Correspondent Gary Lane explains. Adit Silman's issue is over the health minister's ruling allowing leavened bread into hospitals during Passover. Opposition leader and former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu applauded the move. Edith, you prove that what guides you is the concern for the Jewish identity of the state of Israel, the concern for the land of Israel, and I welcome you back home to the nationalist camp. Silman's departure raises the possibility of new elections less than a year after the government took office. While Bennett still remains in power, the loss means he now oversees a Knesset that stands at 60-60. That makes for a dysfunctional government and once again puts Israel's political future in doubt. There's definitely numerous scenarios that can take place. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that Netanyahu uh, can race back into power and form a government. Netanyahu does not have uh, 61 members uh, supporting him. Still, as Treyman points out, it could create an opportunity. This might be the first crack in what could be several others that could lead either to a, a right-wing government being formed without elections or a new election. And polls do show that Netanyahu would soar in a new election and would win more than double the number of votes than any other party, and that more Israelis want him to be the prime minister than any other candidate. The next few days may determine if the Bennett coalition stays together or Israel may once again face new elections. This comes at a time where Israel is inching closer to a political crisis. 
The Prime Minister's coalition has lost its majority in Parliament earlier this week after a member of the Knesset defected. His government is not about to collapse yet, but it's facing a major challenge from Israel's most acute politician. Benjamin Netanyahu is believed to want to make a comeback. This wave of attacks, a perfect storm for the former Prime Minister wanting to reposition himself as Mr. Security. He tweeted, we are undergoing a wave of terrorism with four attacks within a few days. A tough hand and a firm stance is needed to restore peace and security to the citizens of Israel. First Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Bennett pledged there will be no restrictions on Israel's response to this latest security challenge. That is a worry for Palestinians with the holy months of Ramadan underway. One major checkpoint near Jenin was shut down indefinitely. Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank now bracing themselves for more raids, detentions, and possibly fighting and death. So who does the land of Israel actually belong to? Israel was given to the Jews forever, and God first made that promise to Abraham, as we read in Genesis 13, 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. The promise was then confirmed to his son Isaac, as we read in Genesis 26.3. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. The promise was then confirmed to Isaac's son, Jacob, Abraham's grandson, as we read in Genesis 28, 10-13. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set upon the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. The promised land was described in terms of the territory from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River, as we read in Genesis 15:18. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants, I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. God then reaffirmed the promise when he changed Jacob's name to Israel, as we read in Genesis 35, 9-12. Then God appeared to Jacob again, when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob any more, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. As we can plainly see, God gave Israel to the Jews. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Rescue workers pull a 95-year-old woman to safety in the city of Wollongong, south of Sydney. Torrential rain along Australia's east coast has turned roads into rivers and forced thousands of people to evacuate their homes. Intense rainfall in the state of New South Wales has caused repeat floods for months. Several towns are still battling to clear debris. 
Australia's East Coast summer has been dominated by the La Nina weather phenomenon, typically associated with increased rain. Unfortunately, we continue to be in a La Nina um, event, which we know for New South Wales means that we can expect to see higher than average rainfall conditions, which is exactly what we've seen over the past couple of months. And we are expecting La Nina to continue um, throughout the remainder of April. The extreme weather made worse by climate change has raised questions about how prepared Australia is for such disasters and authorities are warning of more rain in the coming days. Major flood warnings have been issued for several suburbs in the south of Sydney, while the entire city of 5 million people has been warned of potential flash flooding this weekend. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, Things will be going on as normal as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. We gotta back up! It's ongoing severe weather whiplash. Nearly 70 reported twisters across a half dozen states over the span of four days, including dozens in Georgia. A region rocked by storms, now trying to clear out debris and take stock of near-death disasters. I heard a big boom and then Marie Jordan was hunkered down in her first floor office when feet away a tree tore through her living room. How grateful are you to be alive? I'm very grateful. Incredibly, in Allendale, South Carolina, not a single fatality, despite the National Weather Service tonight citing EF3 level damage with a final rating to come. Yeah, we in one. One couple appearing to drive right through the twister. Watch that boy! As debris smashed through their back window. The storms stretching all the way to Florida, where a high school class watched a suspected tornado crisscross their campus. It's the debris that's the biggest concern. With millions more still under threat across the mid-Atlantic coast, the pain of damage already done still lingers. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth, and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us that he is in control. And he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. It's meal time in the nation of Yemen, but Ghalib al-Najjar isn't eating so that his children have enough food. He says he and his family live like ants or fish. We eat what we can find. Experts warn that in the months ahead, food is going to be harder to find in many more nations. A perfect storm of several problems is decimating the world food supply. It's being called the biggest food crisis since World War II. An estimated 285 million people face starvation. The head of the World Food Program, former South Carolina Governor David Beasley, says the world food supply already faced a catastrophe before the war in Ukraine. We're so short of funds already, and now with Ukraine, we've got 50% rations for people, for example, in Yemen, Niger, 50% rations, Chad, 50% rations, and 50% don't have anything. Those who are in extreme need. In the U.S., Americans have seen food costs rise almost 10% over last year, the steepest increase in 40 years. And experts predict it will lead to an increase in malnutrition among America's poor. In the developing world, however, it's become a matter of life and death. Russia and Ukraine together produce almost one-third of the world's wheat. But Ukrainian farmers have been sidelined by the war, and Russia has banned exports. They, they've got to be planting again and harvesting again. If, if they don't, then you're going to have a global supply problem. And the war in Ukraine is only the latest of many problems to hit the world food supply. 
Food prices were already high from soaring inflation and fuel costs. Fertilizer prices are now 40% higher than a month ago before the invasion of Ukraine, which along with high fuel prices makes it too expensive for some farmers to plant crops this year. We've never seen these type of increases in fertilizer. You're talking three, 400% increases in a 14 month period. Add to that a drought that damaged this spring's US winter wheat harvest. In China, severe flooding late last year wrecked the wheat harvest and has the communist government trying to buy up as much of the world's supply as possible. And now a growing list of nations have banned agricultural exports to other nations. Reverend Eugene Cho of Bread for the World says the U.S. needs to do more to fight global hunger, asking Congress to approve $3.8 billion in supplemental emergency funding. But let's just talk about Afghanistan. 98% of the population do not have enough food to eat. 98%, 1 million children under the age of five could die from malnutrition by the end of this year. Even Africa's wealthiest nation faces a food crisis. According to Nigerian agri-investor Imal Silva, who told us a majority of Nigerians face malnutrition. The, those that are, are, are most affected are the majority. Um, in the lower and middle class, you know, in the society. You know, those that are living below a particular level of income would feel the pinch, and that's quite a large majority. And Beasley warns the world's food crisis could spiral into a political crisis. You got catastrophe coming to catastrophe. So don't be surprised if you don't see destabilization in several nations over the next six to nine months. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the Tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Multiple officials in Washington voice concerns that Pyongyang could be close to launching another missile or conducting a nuclear test. The U.S. Special Representative for North Korea once again warned the regime not to take any action that could further raise tensions. North Korea is just a week away from celebrating one of its most important holidays, April 15th, the birthday of the country's founder, Kim Il-sung, known as the Day of the Sun. Apart from previously holding festivals and issuing postage stamps to mark the occasion, the regime has also held military parades in the past. As this year marks the 110th anniversary of Kim's birth, experts forecast that one will take place next week as the regime tends to mark 5th and 10th anniversaries with large-scale events. Should a military parade take place, all eyes will be on the type of weapons showcased. The North has previously unveiled major weapons during parades, such as the Pukuk Song-5 submarine-launched ballistic missile last year and the Hwasong-17 intercontinental ballistic missile two years ago. Analysts are warning that the North could also stage further military provocations this year. For one, the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Song Kim, said on Wednesday that there could be another missile launch or even a nuclear test on the Day of the Sun, stressing that Washington and its allies should be prepared. That warning could turn into a reality as the international community has been detecting ongoing developments at the North's Pungeri nuclear weapons site. 
In a new report released through the Open Nuclear Network on Wednesday, satellite images showed clear indications of a newly uncovered entrance to the site's Tunnel 3, evidence of excavation, and continuous signs of traffic near the tunnel. The report added these observations could hint that the North is restoring the tunnel for a future nuclear weapon test. Amid speculation that the North may carry out more military activities, an official from South Korea's Unification Ministry said Thursday that Seoul is keeping close tabs on the North's moves while ensuring firm preparedness for all possibilities based on the close alliance with the United States. Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby also on Wednesday reiterated that the U.S. is in constant consultation with South Korea to ensure the allies have adequate capabilities to counter any aggression from the North. But Kirby declined to comment on whether the U.S. may consider deploying strategic military assets to the Korean Peninsula to help prevent further military actions by Pyongyang. This morning, outrage from President Zelensky as the civilian death toll continues to climb. He says this is an evil without limits, and if not punished, it will never stop. At least 52 people, including five children, died in yesterday's attack on the train station in Kramatorsk. There were thousands of civilians waiting right there, and the Russians knew it. The calculating target, one of the main exit points from eastern Ukraine, a gateway to safety. There are children lying there, this woman says, and a few feet away, the remains of the rocket. U.S. intelligence officials say they believe it was a short-range ballistic missile fired by Russia. It is, again, of a piece of the Russian brutality in the prosecution of this war. Suitcases left behind, strollers, anything people grabbed on their way out. This man, still in shock, says he pulled the body of his dead grandmother out of their car. Kramatorsk is in the Donetsk region, home to the predominantly Russian-speaking population that Putin claims he wants to liberate. But instead, he's trapping them, preventing anyone from leaving. In Bucha, on the outskirts of Kyiv, more body bats, a mass grave exhumed, the grim aftermath of what is now carefully documented as yet another apparent war crime. President Putin is the main war criminal of 21st century. Of course, he is responsible of all of this, what is going on uh, now in Ukraine. In the shadow of the church, officials telling NBC News, all of these people, civilians so far, and all of them died a violent death. The head of the EU, Ursula von der Leyen, visited the site Friday, the highest profile foreign leader to come to Kyiv. It is the unthinkable has happened here. We have seen the cruel face of um, Putin's army. But President Zelensky says it will be even worse elsewhere. In Borodyanka, closer to the Belarus border, they're just starting to gather evidence. It is much more horrific there, Zelensky says. There are even more victims of Russian occupiers. But on the battlefield, the attention turned to the east. The regional governor warning, there is no secret. The battle for Donbass will be decisive. What we have already experienced, all of this horror, it can multiply. Now, while the U.S. says Russia was behind that attack, Russia has denied responsibility. But the regional local government uh, in the Donbass region says at train stations this morning, they are now taking additional precautions to avoid large crowds because clearly Russia is targeting big groups of civilians. Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. This week, Muslims around the world began their month-long time of fasting and prayer, Ramadan. During the past two years, many corporate prayer gatherings were canceled due to the COVID pandemic. But this year was different as Ramadan activities resumed around the world in places like Cairo, Jakarta, and of course, Mecca, Saudi Arabia. In Istanbul, Turkey, Muslims celebrated the first Ramadan call to prayer at the Hagia Sophia Mosque since, since it was converted into a museum in 1934. Two years ago, the Turkish government decided to reconvert the majestic 1,500-year-old cathedral into a mosque. 5,000 miles away, Muslims celebrated unprecedented public prayer in America as they gathered for the first time to pray in New York's Times Square. Former Muslim street preacher Samra Muhammad and other Christians responded with prayers of their own to Jesus. My friend America, you are living God. You are the living water. You are all Jesus. You are the Lord. 
Samer, we asked Samer to share how Christians should pray for Muslims during Ramadan. We need to pray for this month of Ramadan. Let the Lord Jesus Christ open the eyes of the Muslim and they can come to the light of the Lord. We need to pray for the, all the Muslims in the, all the world. Let the peace of God can come to them and show them what is the truth. Because only Jesus is the truth and the way and the life. Todd Nettleton is with the Voice of the Martyrs, a ministry that supports the persecuted church worldwide. What's it like for Christians living in Muslim nations, Todd, during Ramadan? Does it become more difficult for them? Well, it is certainly a time that we want to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters who are living in Islamic nations, because it is a, a time of heightened uh, spirituality, spiritual seeking among Muslims, uh, but sometimes that can result in persecution. One of the things that can happen is uh, they might draw offense from, say, seeing a Christian eating when they're fasting. Wait, why are you eating? This is Ramadan. Those kinds of things can spark a disagreement or even spark violence. It is also a time where uh, because Muslims are, are showing how devout they are, they are showing how loyal they are to Allah, uh, it can be a time of persecution because one of the ways uh, that some radical Muslims use to show their loyalty is by attacking our Christian brothers and sisters. So uh, as we are praying for Muslims to come to know Christ and for Christ to reveal himself to them during Ramadan, we also want to pray for God's protection over Christians who are living in Islamic contexts. Christians are encouraged to pray for Muslims during Ramadan. Why do we do that? Well, as I mentioned, it is a time of, of heightened spiritual awareness for Muslims. They are seeking Allah. They are seeking to know God in a, in a more real way. Uh, and so it can be a great time for us to pray Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to our Muslim friends. Reveal Jesus to them. Uh, this is a time when we hear stories of Muslims having dreams, having visions of Christ. And uh, again, because they're in that sort of state of, of heightened spiritual awareness, those dreams, those visions take on even more significance. And so uh, that is one of the things that we pray during Ramadan. Lord, reveal yourself to Muslims as they are seeking to know you. They are seeking to know God. The prophet Joel predicted an outpouring of dreams and visions as we read in Joel 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. This was confirmed by the Apostle Peter as we read in Acts 2, 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants, and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Can you give us any testimonies of the impact of Christian prayers on Muslims during Ramadan, Todd? One of my friends, uh, Tom Doyle, says that when he talks to Muslims, he will ask, often ask the question, hey, have you had any interesting dreams lately? And because it is so common in the Muslim world for uh, people to have dreams, for people to have visions, for some kind of supernatural encounter. But we have heard the stories of Muslims, uh, even in Mecca, even as they were completing the Hajj pilgrimage, having a vision of Christ or having some other vision that would drive them to the Bible, to the gospel, to the true word of God. And so we know God is at work in the Muslim world, and, and we pray that that is especially true during this month of Ramadan. It's amazing how God is reaching them. Some of the most difficult Muslim nations right now uh, for Christians are which ones? You know, I, I would definitely mention Iran. Iran is, is the, the site of the fastest growing church in the world, which we celebrate, uh, but it is also a site with a lot of persecution. Uh, I think another that comes immediately to my mind is Afghanistan because of all the changes we've seen there in the last year. Uh, this will be a different Ramadan in Afghanistan than it was a year ago. One that I would point to that maybe most people wouldn't think of is northern Mozambique. Uh, there is an ISIS affiliate group in northern Mozambique that is 
specifically targeting pastors, specifically targeting churches, uh, and making life very difficult for our Christian brothers and sisters there. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16.13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ 
will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. through Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!